Well, welcome to our final part on this fall series called The Ghost, where we have been talking about and learning of the expressions and the manifestation, the operation of the Holy Spirit. When I say Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, the Scripture uses those interchangeably. And so uh, we're going to use those interchangeably today, and we have in this entire series. If you're new around here, we would love to get an opportunity to meet you. There's a Connect card that you can fill out right there online digitally, or if you're here in person, you can go to the lobby and fill one of those out. And we have a free gift that we would love to give you. It may just be the most comfortable t-shirt you have ever worn. So uh, go ahead and, and check that out. But we are thankful that you're here today. And uh, this morning, you, you, uh, you're going to get a, a part of a, a message series that if you are maybe tuning in for the first time in a while or maybe the first time ever, uh, this part may seem a little bit out of joint if you don't have the other pieces. So we have made all of those other parts of the series available to you online. You can go right to our website, you can check those out, or you could go to our social media pages. They are there as well. I believe that the Holy Spirit is one of the most misunderstood and possibly misrepresented uh, aspects of the Trinity, of the Godhead. Well, people know a lot about God the Father. We, we pray often uh, in the name of the Father. We pray in the name of Jesus. We know about the, the revelation of Jesus' life and all the things he came to do. But the Holy Spirit seems to be that mysterious part. It seems to be that, that piece that people get a little bit unnerved about or, or maybe they're just not sure to venture into those waters. And so we want to demystify that during this series and give you the confidence to know what God has provided for you as a believer in Jesus. Last week I left off with this verse and I want to just touch on it because I told you that I was going to springboard from that into this topic today. And it's in Acts chapter 10, we have the, the apostle Peter as he's preaching Jesus to the people. It says, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who ordained us, he, he ord was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, Jesus' name, Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, this is like an interruption to his, his sermon. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Somebody say, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what the scripture says, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Say, just as we have. Just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay for a few days. I wanted you to say with me the gift of the Holy Spirit because I want to illustrate this box as a gift being the Holy Spirit. Just, just in your mind's eye for a minute, imagine this box as being the gift. This is the gift. The, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not some manifestation that we may have seen or heard of or, or uh, witnessed in the past, but the gift, the main, the ultimate gift is the Holy Spirit. And if I were just to, to open up this gift and I were to turn this box over, there, there are things within this box that I get as part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not because I have earned it. It's not because I'm super spiritual. It's not because I am uh, elite in the gospel somehow. It's not because I'm a preacher. It's because I have believed, and it said there, those who believed fell upon them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Within this box, without going very deep at all. I can just open the box and I receive forgiveness of sins. That's what we get. The gift of the Holy Spirit ministers to us forgiveness of sins. He ministers to us eternal life. We have the hope of resurrection by just simply opening up the box, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of res resurrection means that as Jesus didn't stay in the grave, but he was raised on the third day, so too you and I will have that promise that our bodies will be raised again on the last day. And the gift of re resurrection is more than just getting a, a new body. It is a total restoration of everything that has ever been broken in your life. Every heartache, every turmoil, every sickness, every broken friendship, everything that has ever been lost in your life is restored at resurrection. And we go into the desire and the dream of new creation, new heavens, and new earth. But I will say in this gift, 
There are other things that are also available if we want, if we desire to open up and see, oh, there is more in this gift. Oh, there's something else available. There are many things that God has that sometimes we settle for just the entry level. We just walk into the door and we get all those things and don't even realize many times because maybe we've not been taught, maybe we don't know, maybe we've not stepped in any further to understand that God has so much more for us in, in, in operation in our lives and in the lives of others. Now, I, I shared with you earlier that there is this, this uh, notion in church history about a, a, a dialogue, I guess it's more of a theology, one is, is called cessation, where the gifts of the Spirit are said to have ceased, or certain gifts anyway, are said to have ceased. And then continuation, where there is this other school of thought that says, no, the, the, the things that happen in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are still available today. I happen to be in the thought process and in the stream of a person that says continuation of the gifts. Now, someone will always say to me when talking about this topic that, well, pastor, you know, the scriptures tell us that whether there be tongues, they will cease. Anybody ever heard that? that that's Bible. That's in there. That's, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. But then they stop short to quote the rest of the verse. It says, and whether there be knowledge it will pass away when the perfect one comes. And what I'm going to tell you, when, when you have the hope of eternity, when you have the hope of, of Jesus coming back, and how many are, are, are looking for and longing for his return? I am looking for Jesus. He is soon to return. When the perfect one comes, we won't need tongues. We won't need word of wisdom. We won't need word of knowledge. We won't need healing and faith and miracles and gifts, all those gifts, because the perfect one has come. Tongues will cease when knowledge has ceased and the perfect one comes. But last I checked, knowledge is still increasing. Just look at the technology that's in your phone. If you have a phone that's more than a year old, it's probably just about obsolete. Why? Because technology increases as knowledge increases, and they start packing more and more into that all of the time. And we know that knowledge hasn't increased, it hasn't, it hasn't stopped, it just keeps on increasing. And we also know the perfect one has not come. Realize that Washington, D.C. is never going to have a perfect one come. Democrat, Republican, Independent, none of them have the ability to solve what ills the world because what ills the world is the condition of the human heart. It is broken. It is sin sick. It is in turmoil. And only Jesus can ease that ache. Only Jesus can bring that peace. And so when we look at this passage, the gift is the Holy Ghost. That is the gift. You don't have to feel uh, that you are a second class citizen or a second class Christian for not having uh, gone any deeper into these boxes or, or any deeper into that. You have eternal life. You're on your way. For, uh, you're, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. That's great. But there is something that keeps cropping up in all of these texts that we've read throughout this series that continues to be one of the biggest questions and probably wrestled down and wrangled with so many people confused, I think, or even misunderstood uh, when it comes to a specific gift. And that is what Peter mentioned that happened when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Quickly after that, there was, and he says, for he heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Well, what is that all about? You have to also understand earlier in the series, I told you that in Mark chapter 16, it was Jesus who first introduced the idea, the concept or said that these signs will follow those who believe in my name. And then he listed five things. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. This is a Jesus idea that Peter is just experiencing, and he's actually elaborating it a little bit more. So in 15 years of pastoring New Freedom Church, I went back in my notes, and I could only find two other times. This will be the third time that I have taken an entire series to talk about the specific nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that are found in Corinthians, but then there's 21 uh, total gifts, probably even more than that. And probably of those two other times, there was only one other time where I gave an entire message to the topic of speaking in tongues. So if, if you're joining us for the first time, you need to go back and look at all those other ones. This one is going to be very concentrated on what about this speaking in tongues? There is one proof that I see again and again at the filling of the church for power, for uh, the Holy Spirit, that I think goes far and above beyond 
the speaking with other tongues. Uh, I, I get questioned a lot uh, in my uh, uh, maybe friend circles or some of the, the clergy circles I run in. Uh, very ecumenical in heart. I love fellowshipping with people of other uh, denominations. Uh, just because they don't worship like me or, or believe exactly like me doesn't mean that I can't find common ground with people when it comes to the name of Jesus. Amen. I mean, there are some some central doctrines that we must agree on, like the divinity of Christ, like his death, burial, resurrection, like his soon return. There are some things that, that we must agree on, but then there are, are secondary issues that just really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me if someone manifests a certain gift or not. I was interviewing a youth pastor years ago, it was probably 10 years ago, and he said, uh, I've looked at your website, I've checked you guys out, and only one problem, he said, I don't speak in tongues. And I said, so? And he said, yeah, but it seems like your church is very much, uh, you know, welcoming of, of that. And that expression is, is uh, you know, something that you, your church practices on, on a pretty regular basis. I don't speak in tongues. And I said, listen, it doesn't bother me that you don't speak in tongues as long as it doesn't bother you that I do. So that's okay, right? And so we, we found a, a common ground there. And so this is not a, a central issue to the church. This is a secondary kind of an issue. But I, I do want to take a few moments and talk about what this gift is, what this grace ability is, because there is a difference between those two, and how that it operates and manifests in our lives. If we're going to look at uh, the concept, the, the gift, the grace of speaking in tongues, we have to understand that Paul the Apostle is probably our go-to guy when it comes to the teaching and the functionality of this gift. So let's just look and see what did Paul have to say about this. You can find it all in 1 Corinthians 14, but there's many other places. He said this, I would that you all spoke with tongues. That's, that's the Apostle Paul. I would that all, everybody spoke with tongues. Then he goes on and says, I speak in tongues more than you all or more than y'all. Paul must have had ancestors from Kentucky. I would that you'd speak in tongues more than y'all. I, I wish everybody would, and I do it often is basically what he's saying. And then he goes on and he says, do not forbid to speak in tongues. But then later on, he says, don't abuse the gift for a public spectacle. And this is where a lot of the confusion has come in or a lot of the, the, uh, the, the misunderstanding has come in is that people have watched it be abused in a public setting for a spectacle or to draw attention that someone is more spiritual. Speaking in tongues doesn't make you more spiritual. Speaking in tongues doesn't, doesn't do anything like that. It's not for a showcase. It is the enablement of God to do something special in your life. And in public setting, it says, don't go public with speaking in tongues unless there is an interpretation. These are some guidelines and some recommendations that the Apostle Paul laid out. He also gives us the difference of the gift if you look at 1 Corinthians 12. Some of this is teaching, so just hang in there with me. We'll get to, we'll get to it. 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about how the gift of tongues operates in the local setting. And then in 14 chapter, which we're gonna talk about today, he indicates that there is a, a private edification. There is something personally that the individual gets out of speaking in tongues. And so this is more of a grace for tongues. There are people who have spoken tongues all their lives, never publicly, never for an interpretation kind of a thing. That's a different kind of setting. And Paul, the apostle, gives us the differences in those. I want to borrow some language from uh, Dr. Jack Hayford, who pastored uh, Church on the Way, Van Nuys, California, for well over 40 years. He's the chancellor uh, currently of King's University in Dallas, Texas. And he wrote a book called The Beauty of Spiritual Language. Think about it. The Beauty of Spiritual Language. And he uses this concept of a river to illustrate how that speaking in tongues is applicable and benefits the believer. Look at John chapter 7. I think this is a good verse to, to start off with. And I've got four points for you, and then we'll go. It says this, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, now these are the words of Jesus, If anyone thirsts, he didn't say that this is mandatory. He didn't say you have to do this. This doesn't uh, solidify you for salvation. But he said, if anyone thirsts, it's a desire, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scriptures have said. Now, what's the prerequisite? It's belief. It's he who believes in me as the scriptures have said. 
Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. Don't you love it when the Bible illustrates and when the Bible interprets the Bible? Here's what exactly happened. Jesus is talking about this river, but he's saying it's flowing from our heart. Now, we know a river doesn't flow from our heart. A river has a source, a fountainhead. It comes down the, the, the banks, and a river is a body of water that is in motion. But Jesus said this concerning the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is like a river whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, Jesus said, it's, it's good that I go to the Father so that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Paraclete would come. And until he went to the Father, it didn't happen. So on the day of Pentecost, what we see happen is that Jesus told them, go and tarry in Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the promise. What was the promise? The promise was the Holy Spirit. Wait for the promise. And it says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, suddenly, a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind, came and filled the whole room where they were sitting. And cloven tongues of fire sat upon each and every one of them. And they began to speak in other tongues. Now, we look at that as, wow, that must be the sentinel experience for everybody who gets saved. That's actually not the sentinel experience. In, in, in some of my upbringing and in, in my denominational doctrines uh, growing up as a child, it was that when you are saved, the initial evidence of the fulfillment of the Spirit is speaking with other tongues. So that's a doctrinal thing. It's not a Bible thing, though there are some verses that can, can probably be used to back that up. It's not a biblical declaration. Here's what I believe Jesus was saying, and, and, and we use his words. He said, but you will be witnesses for me when the Spirit has come upon you. And you shall witness, you shall tell of my story in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. You've heard that. So speaking in tongues is not the seal of God's approval upon you of, okay, now you're saved, but rather the power to be a witness for Jesus. I would much rather see somebody be a powerful witness for Christ than to hear him speak in tongues all day long. Because speaking in tongues is not the apex of Christian experience. You have to hear me on that because we're talking about this. And so many people have gone away from services or from teachings thinking that they're less than because they don't operate in a certain gift. You're not less than. The power to be a witness, that is proof positive that something has changed on the inside of you. Why would you tell about this person that changed your life if you haven't been modified, transformed on the inside? That power to witness is the sentinel mark of receiving Christ. But Jesus referenced this as a river, a river that is flowing. And we can all get in our mind's eye the picture of a river uh, that is not staying still. It looks calm and it looks mild, but if you get in that river, you can feel the force of it rushing you to another place. Rivers have power behind them. Jesus talked a lot about water. If you, if you notice this in the scriptures, there's a lot of illustration to water, and that's why we, we liken the Holy Spirit many times to water or a dove or oil. There's lots of different types of illustrations here. But remember with me when Jesus talked about the well of water. He was meeting a woman at the well, and he said to her that if you drink of the water that comes up out of that well, he's talking about the literal water. He said, if you drink of that water, woman, you will thirst again. Because just taking one drink of water doesn't satisfy your thirst forever. You have to continue to drink water. Our bodies are more than 70% made up of water. We have to have it every single day. It is essential for life. We have to have water. And Jesus illustrated it to the, like this to the woman. He said, you come to this well every single day to get water. You need that for sustenance of your body. But if you drink of the water that I have to offer, you will never thirst again. So the well of living water is Jesus. He is that well of living water. And when he talks about that water, he's talking about the water of salvation. But now he's talking about those who have believed who've tasted of that well, who've received salvation, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. So I just want to talk about some rivers that I find in the scripture that deal with this expression of the Holy Spirit. The river of edification. Now think of a flow, a river flows. Edification means to build up, 
right? That's when you take, take an edifice, you build something. So God has the desire for us to be built a house unto the Lord. We are lively stones, are we not? Jesus, the chief cornerstone. When we are building, we are being edified. 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, here's the apostle again. He says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So in a public setting, tongues, if it is to be a, like a stop in the service or to edify the entire church is to be interpreted, which forms prophecy. But he who speaks in a tongue, just because somebody next to you in worship is speaking in a tongue and worshiping God, they're edifying themselves. That doesn't mean it needs to be interpreted. They're edifying themselves. The apostle Paul gives great illustration for doing that. Jude, the apostle Jude also in 120 says, but you beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying how? Praying in the Holy Spirit. So we can pray in our understanding, things we know, words we say, and we can pray in the Spirit. We can go from one to another. You can kind of just seamlessly go from praying in the understanding, praying in the Spirit. You are building up yourself. Now, some might say, this is kind of selfish, Pastor. Why are you doing this uh, building up of yourself? Why do you have to edify yourself? Well, really, it's, it's kind of like telling somebody who lifts weights because they want to be more muscular on the outside, that, that's selfish. No, if, if, you're, if you're a runner, your heart needs to be healthy, you need to build up your endurance. You need to build up yourself. And so uh, there, are, uh, n- there are nothing selfish about, in a spirit realm, building yourself up. There's nothing selfish at all about that. This is a life of service unto God. And there are times when, when this, this river of, of edification needs to happen, there are times when you're just tired. You're tired physically, mentally, emotionally. You've, you've gone through a long season of rush and hurry, and you've gone from event to event, and you just find yourself kind of like exacerbated at the end. Like you just, you just really can't go anymore. Well, in those moments, praying in the Spirit gives you a buildup. It is an encouragement. It is an, an edification that happens on the inside. And there are times when, when I'll uh, find myself just maybe... Uh, at that place where I, I, I would rather take a nap, I, but I've got a, a sermon to preach. And so maybe on the front row, I'll just begin to pray in the spirit and God is building me up. He's given me the strength that I need. And you don't have to know that it's happening. It's not a spectacle. It's not anything that I need to advertise, but God and me are having this moment where the spirit of God is praying. And in and, and, uh, Romans, it tells us that uh, when we don't know what to pray as we ought, Like, we should know what to pray, but there are times where you're like, I just don't know what to pray. Pastor, if I knew, I would pray it, but I don't know what to pray. Well, when you don't know what to pray as you ought, the Spirit himself with groanings that cannot be uttered, sometimes you don't even know how to articulate. You just, oh, Lord, oh, Jesus, ah, just your your groanings that cannot be uttered. You can't even make an articulate word out of it. With groanings that cannot be uttered, we'll pray for you. This, this building up, praying in the spirit, it's powerful. It's connection to God. Let's, let's look at the next one. The river of communication. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So, obviously, there's a difference with a public setting, which would be the gift of tongues in operation, and the grace of tongues to speak directly unto God, not speaking unto men. For if I pray in, the, in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And people have had a hard time with that, thinking that somehow they're in a trance or, or that, that they can't control it if they're speaking in a tongue. No, you can control it, okay? You're not in a trance. We're not cultic. <laughs> we're, not, we're not trying to teach something that, that there is mind control or the body is unable to function. When you're praying in the spirit... There are times you don't even know what you're saying. You're not even aware of what you're praying. Why? Because you're not praying to men, you're praying unto God. I'll never forget hearing a story in our family, kind of a cute story where uh, we always encourage the, the children in our, our, our family to, to pray over the meal or something. It's, it's, it's a neat little ritual to do. Plus, they're so cute, aren't they, when kids pray? I mean, it's so sincere, it's so honest. And I remember one time uh, hearing a story we told uh, about uh, uh, you know, one of the kids in our family praying at a meal and someone else at the table said, I couldn't hear you. And he looked up, he said, that's okay, Grandpa. I wasn't praying to you. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes, perfected praise. It's true. When we pray in the Spirit, we are praying 
directly unto God. And that's where many have, have gotten this notion that, that uh, and I, I like this, I don't know that it's, it's really like I have chapter and verse on it, but I think this could, could support it, that Satan doesn't know what you're praying when you're praying in the Spirit. He doesn't know. It's like a, it's like a code that he can't decipher. You know, in World War II, they, they say the war was won by, by these enigmas and these, these codings so they would know where the, the ships were going and the submarines. And if, if the other uh, enemy forces could crack the code, then they would know where the alignment is and they could take out the, the, the forces. And so how, how much more would it apply in our lives when we don't really know what we need to pray as we pray? We bypass our intellect because my mind will get in the way. I'll pray for things that don't even need to be prayed for. I'll pray for it the way, I don't know if you're like me, but I pray in the affirmative almost all the time. God, this is Jimmy. I'll take all you can give me. I pray for the yes answer. I pray God do this and God do that. And I think that the answer to my prayers will be yes, but God doesn't always answer in yes. Sometimes the best answer to your prayer is no. You don't need that in your life. But God, I want that in my life. But no, you don't, you don't really, really want that. in your, You think you want that today, but you won't want that long term. You might want that short term. You don't want that long term. And so I don't really know how to pray right sometimes. The Spirit himself will pray for us so that we pray in the right way. It's a river of communication. Uh, there's some common questions that come up uh, when, when talking about uh, speaking in tongues and, and teaching on this. And, and that is, one of the questions is people ask, why is it that the words that I say sound redundant? Why do the words sound the same again and again and again? It sounds repeated. Um, other things people will say is like, how do I know it's really a language? Like the enemy will challenge your mind to say, oh, that's just gibberish. That's not really a language. How, how do I know that? Uh, you might also ask and wonder, it, it, is this really doing any good? And so anytime you step out in faith to do something for the Lord, there will be a challenge of doubt that comes to your heart. How do you know that this is really the word of God? Y you can doubt it, many have. How do you know? How do you know that when you said yes to Jesus, you said that prayer, how do you know that you're really saved? It's a step of faith. How do you know that when we open up these panels of board and you get into this water and you get baptized, that that's any different than taking a bath? How do you know? How do you know when you go back to that table back there, those two little candles and there's communion, you can take communion anytime, the Lord leads you to do that. You can do it by yourself. We do it corporately several times a year, but you can do it anytime. How do you know that that bread and that wine represent the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus? How do you know? It's by faith. And oftentimes, when, whenever I have heard people uh, just first start speaking in tongues, it doesn't sound like an articulate language. But when our children first started speaking, it didn't sound very articulate either. Come on. It was like, dad, dad, dad. Ma, ma, ma. It was like dada for a long time until she had to teach you. No, it's ma, 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 you know. <laughs> you know. But it's just a syllable here or there. And then they develop into fully functioning adults. And then they start talking to the time you finally say, would you please stop talking? They learn it pretty quick. But every language like that, it, it, it kind of starts off with a syllable here. I remember when I was really seeking, I was, uh, I was 17 years old. I'd, I'd gotten born again when I was 15. And I really, um, I had some encounters with God before that, but at, at, at 15, I really, truly, like wholeheartedly gave my life to Jesus. And that, that was like a, a game changer in my life. And for the next two years, I was really seeking out the things of God. And, and in my denomination at that time, you know, speaking in tongues was like the apex. Like if you could speak in tongues, you're like super elite kind of. And I wanted that status, you know, you know what I mean? I wanted that status. But I, I just, I would come to the altar and I just, I felt like I was disappointed. Every time I would go away and I just didn't have that experience. And I really wanted that experience. And if you were like me, you were in a church where, you know, you'd come forward to pray and there would be someone on each side of you. And one of them is saying, just hold on, brother, just hold on. The other one's going, just let go, son, just let go. And I'm like, well, do I hold on? Do I let go? What do I do? You know, you know, we mean well, but, but there's that, that tug of war. And so that, that was me. And I remember reading through the book of Acts and I was all by myself. I got to chapter two and I was in my room all by myself. And this, this like, couple of, of phrases started coming to my mind and I was scared to speak them because I didn't want to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You know what I mean? Like you've read that, like don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I, I didn't want to offend God in some way. So I, I just kind of blurted it out real quick in my room, looked around, nobody's there, but you know, I just want to make sure because it kind of felt awkward to me. And I, 
I just went to sleep. I didn't even think no more about it. About two weeks later, I was in a church service and I had a breakthrough moment where I started to hear that in my mind's eye again, like in my, in my head, I guess in my spirit, I can't really explain it, but, but I was emboldened and encouraged to, to go ahead and speak that out. And when I did, <clears throat> it just started flowing and it's like, wow, that is what it is. And my mind wasn't taken over. I wasn't in a trance. It wasn't something so super spiritual. I was walking on clouds, but it was truly the beginning of walking with God through the beauty of spiritual language. And throughout the years of, of my life, since 17 to 42, there have been times where that has sounded a lot more articulate. There have been times where I have spoken in public settings and interpreted that tongue. There's been times where I've spoken in tongues in a public setting and someone else interprets. Uh, there have been times when just in the quiet of my heart, just needing to, to go to God that, that I'll do that. And so uh, it, it changes. But let's just suppose you have this question. What about, is this helping anybody? What about, okay, good. For, for, Mom, thank you for clapping for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> what about when the language sounds repetitive? I mean, I, I've, I've experienced that, and I think some have gotten discouraged because it's, it's just like repetitive, and they wonder, well, maybe that's just gibberish. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just doing that. Let me ask you this. If the only thing that your children could ever say is, Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you. Dad, I love you. Mom, I love you. If that's the only thing that they were able to say, as a parent, as a human parent, would you ever really tire of hearing that? Now, maybe after the hundredth time for the day, you'd say, go to bed, we'll hear it tomorrow. But you would wake up the next day and you would still want to hear that, would you not? Our Heavenly Father is not discouraged. He is not disappointed if all that we ever are able to say is, Father, I love you. Father, I adore you. Father, I love you. I was doing the study for this, and, and I, I don't know, uh, sometimes movies, they just come back to your mind, and I'm sorry if you think I'm all secular and stuff because I go to the movies, but I do. I've shaken off that bondage, all right? <laughs> I like popcorn a lot and Coke. I'm sorry. But I was thinking about this, this movie uh, that we went to see as a family. Back in 2014, there was a movie called Guardian of the Galaxy. It's kind of silly, and they're going to win, win the universe. You know, these guys are going to take it. But there's one specific character that I just really had in my mind's eye when I thought about this question of what if it's just redundant? What if it's the same word? And, and you, those of you that have seen Guardian of the Galaxy, now, uh, they, uh, they didn't pay me to say, I wish they did. They didn't give me any advertisement. You can probably go find it out there and watch it. There is a character that you can't help but not love, and his name was Groot. And he's like a twig. He's like, he's like a, a stick guy or something. And, and I mean, that's what he looks like to me. And you know, the entire movie, all he says is, I am Groot, or I am Groot, I am Groot. That's all he ever says. Yet with every phrase, you almost know what he's saying. Even though he keeps saying the same thing, it's like the expression is different, <laughs> the setting is different, the in circumstance changes, and I am Groot is like, say it again. Like, I want to hear, I know what it is, but say it again. And that's why we don't have to ever worry in our spiritual language if it sounds the same. Ask God, maybe he'll give you more. Maybe he'll, he'll let you, you have, uh, you know, articulate language. It just sounds like it's free-flowing. I mean, hey, I've been impressed with people that, man, like, like my mentor, wow, it's amazing. I like standing next to him in worship. I love hearing him speak in his heavenly language. It's like an entire encyclopedia is able to be spoken. But that's not everybody's experience. And we need to stop comparing ourselves with other people. The Apostle Paul said we become unwise when we compare ourselves with ourselves. I'll say it again. We need to stop comparing ourselves to other people. God just wants you to compare you to how you were yesterday. Are you better than you were yesterday in Jesus? Have you excelled in your faith more than last year? Are you at a different place in your journey than you were five years ago? Don't worry about what other people are doing or saying or how spiritual their life looks. How about you? Because you know, the fact of the matter is, when you stand before God on that day and those books are open, 
He is not going to measure you against your Bible school teacher, against the deacon in the church. He's not going to say, well, the pastor did this, and I'll see how you measure up. He is not going to measure you against anything. He's going to measure you based on how well did you execute what you learned about this? How well did you live out the life of God that was put on the inside of you? Did you witness for me? Did you show forth the faith of God in your life that you told others about me? It doesn't matter how many times you spoke in tongues. I believe that the power to witness is the sanctioning, is the ultimate in how that you express the infilling of the Spirit. Not any other manifestation of the gift. I'd much rather see someone a powerful witness than ever hear them speak in tongues. That is what God has for us. Let me, let me go into the... Uh, the third point, the river of mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. Now, here's what the apostle says. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. Don't try to figure somebody's language out. No one understands him unless God gave you the gift of interpretation. He says no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, I shared with you a couple weeks ago the importance of having a Bible concordance. You, like you, you need to look up some of these words when you're reading along. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, the translators did the best job that they could, but sometimes there's, there's multiple meanings to a Greek word. We might have one meaning in the English language. I'll give you an example. The word love. I love my house. I love my car. I love my dog. I love my wife. It's the same word, love. But when I use that word in context, you understand that I have a greater affinity for my dog than I do my car, usually. And I should have a greater affinity, and I do, for my wife than I do my house. But we use one word for it. The Greek language has four words, at least, maybe even more than that for the word love. So when it says that he who prays in an unknown tongue, or he who prays in tongues, prays mysteries unto God, in our vernacular, a mystery is something to be solved. Something to be figured out, something to be investigated. If there is a mystery, then let's go find out what happened and let's go solve and crack the case. But that's not what the first century word mysterion in Greek really meant. It actually meant something being revealed. A mystery was that being revealed. We use this, this word apocalypse. And unfortunately, they've, they've created an entire gaming uh, uh, industry over the uh, zombie apocalypse. And then everybody's getting all their beanie weenies ready, stored up in the basement and all their ammo and guns and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm not anti-gun or anything like that, but I'm saying to you, we think of the word apocalypse as some catastrophic event. But truly, the word apocalypse means revelation. Just look at some of the older titles for the last book in your Bible, and it will tell you that it is the apocalypse of the apostle John. It is the revelation of of John, actually the revelation that John received of Jesus Christ. It is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It's not any great catastrophic thing. It is a revealing. So when you pray mysteries in the spirit, you're not praying something that's unknown. You're actually praying something that God wants to reveal. This is a river that uncovers Christ in your life. This is a river that helps you to understand the, 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 the significance of a verse in the Bible. You ever just really wrestled with something in the, in the scriptures and how can that be? Well, there have been times personally where I've walked away from a text. I didn't understand it. I've studied, I've read all the commentaries and I'll just be praying. I'll be praying in the spirit, just on, just on my own, in my office, just praying. And it'll dawn on me, go check this out, go look that up. And wow, that's what that means. So he who prays in a tongue prays mysteries unto God. There is a revealing of what needs to happen in a given situation in our lives that can be a result as praying in the Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit, God reveals things to us. Sometimes motives that have been hidden become revealed. Sometimes the tactics that are being employed and, and strategies that are happening in people around you will come to revelation as a result of praying in the Spirit. There are those times when the Holy Ghost will reveal the true desires of our own heart. The Holy Ghost will reveal to us something that we previously didn't even see because we were blinded 
We didn't have the insight to it. We didn't want to see it. Many times we, you know, the, the worst kind of deception is self-deception. I can tell myself a lie easier than you can tell me a lie because it was in my own voice. I believe it more readily. And by praying in the Spirit, we can uncover the Spirit reveals those things to us. The fourth one is the river of power. Ephesians 3 and 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. This is power. To be strengthened with might or power through whose spirit? His spirit in the inner man. What is the inner man? Again, the Bible interprets the Bible. Next verse. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Somebody challenged me one time and said, the Bible never tells you to ask Jesus into your heart. Where, where does it say in the, there, in the Bible there's a sinner's prayer? I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here because there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible, by the way. There's no specific magical prayer that you must pray. And we, we oftentimes will phrase it in, have you accepted Jesus into your heart? Well, the apostle says here that Christ may dwell where? In your mind? In your elbow? In your foot? No, that Christ may dwell in your heart. Yeah, I want Jesus in my heart. Through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love, the love of Christ. Anyone operating in spiritual gifts, whether it's speaking in tongues or anything else, must do it with the foundation of love. That is the basis for all the gifts, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wait a minute. That I may be filled to all the fullness. I thought that once that I said yes, I got everything. Well, apparently the gift is the Holy Spirit and you can be filled. And then he goes on and says, with all the fullness, which means that there is more than just stepping into the threshold. Somebody said, oh, I'll just be content with a little cabin in the corner of glory. Not me. I want a mansion in that city. I'm not going to settle for just streets of gold. We use that for pavement down here. I want a mansion because he said he has gone to prepare a place for me. And if he goes, he will come again and receive me to himself that where he is, and he's not in a little cabin in the corner of glory, there I may be also. I want the fullness of God. If they'll come on up and, and get ready, we're going to close. Listen, I am not on a quest to convince anybody to do anything or experience anything that they don't want to do. This is a decision between you and God. But I will tell you that it's interesting to me, people will stand in line for three hours at Kings Island just to ride the new roller coaster that they built last year and not think anything of it. People this time of year will camp out outside of Best Buy so they can get $150 off of a big screen television just so they can have that value of that purchase. And when you find a good deal, what do you do? You call your friends and say, you better get on down to the wholesale club. They've got these for sale. You don't want to miss out. Listen, I'm not on a quest to get anybody to experience anything you don't want to experience. But I would not be a faithful witness of the gospel if I wouldn't share with you that even though you don't have to go any further and open up any of those gifts, you might like what else is in that box. You might enjoy what else is there. I'll close with this story. At the turn of the century, 1900s, there were immigrants from Europe that were making their way across the Atlantic. By the millions, they wanted to search out and to get to this land called the great United States of America. Our country was that shining city on a hill. Everybody in all the world was envious of that land because it was the land of great opportunity. If I could just get to America, then I can provide for my family. I can have a life that I've never had before. The story goes that this one European immigrant worked and worked and worked until he finally could book his fare for a passage on one of those great steamships to get across the Atlantic. It was gonna be a three week journey to get there, but he finally had his fare money and he bought his ticket. Only problem was for three weeks, I don't wanna fast. I'm gonna to have to have something to eat. So before he got on the ship, he went and he bought himself the biggest jar of peanut butter that he could find and some bread. He only bought a, 
general cabin ticket. So he would sit in his room night after night as he would hear above him the partying and the, the stories, everything happening in the dining hall. But he was on his way to America. So he sat right down there in his general cabin and he ate his peanut butter and his bread. And he was content just to get to that land until something strange occurred. Two days before the ship was to land on Ellis Island, he was making conversation in the midday with one of the upper class room cabins and the guy said, hey, why don't you come and sit with us at dinner tonight when you come out for dinner? And he said, oh, no, 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 I, I could never do that because I'm only in general class fare. And the man from first class said, well, what are you talking about? Everybody who boarded this steamboat, everybody who made the ticket price was invited to the dinner the entire time of the three week journey. You may have had a different table, but you had bountiful supply of all the buffet and he was shocked here he had forfeited his ability to walk into another room and dine and enjoy all that his original fare had purchased and yet he settled for sitting in his room eating peanut butter i may not be speaking to you today but somebody watching us online somebody listening to this today is saying i think there's something more to this life with God. I, I, I enjoy my salvation. I've enjoyed, but there is something more. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you desire and if you seek and you want it, there is more. If you say it's not real, it'll never happen, and you're content just to get in the door of heaven, that's fine too. We'll give high fives in the new Jerusalem. That's okay. But for those who want more, there's more. God has a bounty of blessings forevermore. Let's all stand. I wanted you to stand because I'm gonna pray. At the end of my prayer, you can be seated, they're gonna sing. After they sing, one of our elders, Jeff is gonna come, maybe Lauren and Sue, they're gonna come. <clears throat> but here's what I want you to do. If you desire a gift from God, whatever that gift is, if you desire more from God, then would you just simply agree with me in this prayer? Would you agree with me? And, and I'm gonna ask you to do this. Just take your hands if you want this prayer. Just, just hold your palms to heaven. This is like a sign of receiving. And say this, God, I want all you have for me. God, I've been afraid to ask. I've been afraid of what it might look like. What I might sound like. What I might do. But today, I'm not afraid. I surrender to you and I receive. I receive in your presence today. Let's go ahead and worship as they sing. You can stand or be seated. Ask God, he'll give it to you, ask him.